Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live, the longest running weekly photography live stream on YouTube. If you're watching live, you probably already know the drill. Please leave me a note in the chat. Let me know you're here. Let me know where you are in the world. It's always cool to see where people are tuning in from. And if you're watching the replay, no worries. You're an important part of this process. Drop a comment below the video so that I know you were here already. Gosh, we got a lot of people here. Lynn sneaking in here from New York. Blair is here for the first time. Awesome. Live in Canada. Lawrence in the Philippines. Uh, let's see. Who else do I got here? Whoops. I'm looking at the wrong screen. I got Marius in Poland. Uh, we've got Calvin up in Maine. We've got David in San Antonio. Jeff in Maryland. Joe in Michigan. Uh, Mark in Western Oregon. Ron from tomorrow in Australia. Uh, we got, what is that? Simple Skins Leather. I'm going to guess that's like Ohio, maybe. Uh, Robert in the UK. Hey, it's kind of cool, right? We legit have photographers here from all over the world. And you know what? Especially for you, those of you that aren't in the United States, I'm going to ask all of you to make it a point to try and participate when I talk about my main topic tonight, because I'm curious if you're seeing the same trend on your threads. So maybe we can get a few people involved in that discussion as we go forward. But all of you, thank you for being here. As always, greatly appreciated. We're going to skip right over education stuff tonight. I don't have any big announcement. The big one's coming, I promise. But we're going to go right into the photo quote. All right, tonight, my quote, or I should say this week, my quote, is from one of my favorite photographers. So, you know, if you want to nerd out and you want to know a little bit about who, you know, Joe is really into and who Joe studied when he was a kid growing up and all that stuff, the photographer's name is Bert Stern. Uh, I'm putting a link in the chat. It's already below the video. Uh, to a page on my website where you can learn a lot more about him, see some of his books, uh, get a link to his website, uh, all that kind of stuff. But the quote that we've got for tonight, when a portrait evokes a feeling, then you've got something. Technique isn't really important. What I want is a believable moment. Now, as I'm sure you can all imagine, I post a quote like that online and you can bet your life there are plenty of photographers who don't know who Bert Stern is, don't know why we should even care about Bert Stern, and quickly run off some smart aleck dismissive comment about how that's a bunch of crap. Um, and for those, too bad, right? They're idiots. For the rest of us, here's what you need to understand. There's one selection of pictures that you can look at and you will completely understand where this quote comes from, why this quote is so spot on and can be so valuable to you to the way that you approach your work. And understand that the man making this quote is a person who's very accomplished with his camera, well, was very accomplished with his camera when he made this quote. But Bert Stern uh, is responsible for a lot of things. I'm gonna let you read the bio on my website but most famously, he is responsible for a set of pictures that have gone down in history. They are considered to be iconic. They are referred to as the last sitting of Marilyn Monroe. And as you've probably heard me talk about before, because it comes up a lot, and as you might guess from tonight's topic, his work, his style of work on this particular shoot, all of his images weren't taken this way, but the images from the last sitting have always been very inspirational to me in the sense that I have just always gravitated towards them and towards that effect. Marilyn Monroe obviously was a very processed movie star. And what I mean by that is she had a look. It was a look that was developed, it was created, and that's the look that the general public, we came to know most of the time in her pictures, in her movies, etc. The Last Sitting is a set of images that were taken about six weeks before her death in a hotel room. And unfortunately, 
she had apparently or allegedly uh, spent most of the night before drinking, potentially doing some pills or drugs, and was really not in any condition to do the cover photo shoot that she was supposed to do that day. I believe it was for Vogue. Um, she had an ongoing relationship with Bert Stern. They had worked together numerous times. He went to pick her up, found her, that, you know, her in a condition they weren't going to be able to shoot, and he spent the weekend with her, basically to make sure she was going to be okay. But fortunately, in his camera or in his car, he had a camera with a couple rolls of film, and he went and got the camera, and they took pictures. and And as a result, you've got a series of pictures that. Uh, are not taken on, under ideal lighting conditions. In fact, all of the light is behind her in the photographs. So he's basically exposing for the shadows, for reflected light. And the images are not the normal, processed, perfect, um, blonde bombshell Marilyn Monroe that we were used to seeing. Her hair's a mess, her makeup's messy. And the best part of it is they're captivating you honestly feel like you are there with her in this small room interacting with her. Um, so again, part of the reason why I do share these quotes with all of you is hopefully so that you all get an opportunity to uh, take a few moments, learn about these photographers, learn about their body of work. And, and I promise you, you will be amazed at how much it can help you with your photography today. And I will tell you from my own personal experience, I sincerely wish that when I was learning photography as a teenager, even through my early 20s, I wish I hadn't have been an idiot when people told me that I should go and I should look at the work of the greats. My attitude was, hey, they've been there, done that. I don't want to do that. And I realize now that I'm much older that these photographers weren't telling me to go look at the work of the greats to do what they do, because actually I can't do what they do for various reasons, anything from technology to societal changes, whatever. But they sent me there to look, to really actually take the time to read and consider why they do did what they did, why they made the choices they made, how they did it, what it took. And in doing so, is an incredible amount that you can learn about your own work. So I do want to share with you real quick, I'm creating a section on my website. And this is a work in progress. Uh, it's literally being updated almost every day at this point. But if you have been following the photo quotes that uh, I post both on Facebook uh, and Twitter in my Tog Knowledge community, uh, also on threads uh, and on Instagram at 80% photography. Link is in the description below. Um, you can click from them to these pages on my websites. And so we'll go to Bert Stearns. And when you get to these pages, there's a couple things you're going to get. Uh, it starts out with a brief bio. You can actually see a photo of what they look like. Uh, and then there are links. And here are the important links. You can click to read a full biography of the photographer and their career. You can click to see some of the photo quotes that I have shared from them. You can click in each case to see videos about that photographer, in most cases, interviews. So you get to hear from them and learn from them in their own words. You will have links to any books of their photographs that they have created. They'll take these are Amazon links. They are affiliate links. If you buy something, uh, I will make a couple dollars that help support the show. It doesn't change your price. And if I'm being really honest, most of you aren't going to want to buy the books because they're crazy expensive. But um, in many cases, when you click on Amazon, you probably know on the left-hand side of the page, you can see samples from the books. So you get to see quite a few of uh, their images there also. And then, of course, up at the top, there is a link to a website where you are able to see more of their images, and especially if they are living photographers, usually read their current bios, see their current work, etc. And then sprinkled throughout each of these pages are some little trivia facts that you'll have a hard time finding online. I have literally gone through a lot to do these various pieces of research, but Bert Stern in particular, he was a skilled ping pong player, and he often challenged his subjects to ping pong matches. 
Uh, he was once arrested for jaywalking in front of the Plaza Hotel in New York City. And he was also a skilled interviewer who had a knack for putting his subjects at ease. When you look at his work, you'll appreciate that little tidbit of information. So there is a link um, to his page in the description below the video. Again, I encourage you to spend some time with these, uh, read through the bios, study the images. Um, believe me, there is a lot that you can learn from them. And as I mentioned, just in case you don't already follow me, Facebook, Twitter, or what, X, uh, LinkedIn, um, and Threads, and Instagram at 80% Photography. Every day, Monday through Friday, I post one of these quotes from an accomplished photographer along with a link that will allow you to learn more about that photographer as well as see more of their work. So don't miss out on that, okay? And just a reminder, all of you, if you're here, if you're watching later, you're part of a growing, growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. It would help me a lot, and it would help more people learn about The Last Frame if you could do me a favor, do me a solid and hit that thumbs up, right? It's right below the video. It's the simple algorithm thing. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends the show to other photographers. All right, let's move on. Okay, so uh, I shared on social media today, so you might have missed it, that's okay, we're going to talk about it now. Uh, I shared a new article that I just posted on my website. And just in case there's any of you here that have religiously followed my website for years, um, you may think, I'm pretty sure I saw an article that he did about this before. You're right, I did. But I spent the last few days and I have dramatically updated this article with a lot more detail, a lot more tips and tricks and things like that. So I basically give me a new title, new URL, and I've relaunched it. But it's also since Bert Stern was our quote of the week, this is also our topic for the week, if you will. So the article is called Easy Backlit Beauty Lighting Technique with One two or three lights. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to share that link in the chat for you. Uh, the link is also in the description below the video. But I also then want to go ahead and switch my screen over here. And first, we're just going to look at a couple images to give you uh, a, a couple pieces of information about this. And then I'll show you uh, a quick lighting diagram setup of how this works. So as I already explained, my influence for this technique, because this is not a technique, I should say right out of the box, this is not a technique that you're going to find in a lot of lighting books, right? Um, yeah, you may find some lighting videos about it. I've done videos about it in the past, but you're not gonna find this described in books where they're talking about like Rembrandt lighting and two to one lighting and butterfly lighting and clamshell lighting. You're not gonna find this there. In fact, a lot of people would argue that this is horrible lighting because it breaks all the rules. One of the most obvious rules is that the overwhelming majority of the light, and depending on how you do it, all of the light goes behind your subject. Legit. So your subject is in shadow and you're exposing for the shadows. Now, indeed, as the article states, which is part of the update that I've done to it, you can do this with one, two, three lights. You can do it with reflectors, multiple reflectors. So I'm, I'm gonna show you some of the examples, but to give you a sense of the images, what I love about them, similar to those Marilyn Monroe images, they are very dreamy. There's, there's kind of a purity to them. It's also worth pointing out, in fact, I'm gonna go back really quick. Notice how much frizz this young lady actually has in her hair, especially on the camera left side of her face. She had just as much frizz on the outside. If you're ever in a pinch and you're working maybe with a model, you're not gonna be able to use this for every kind of portrait, right? But maybe you're working with a model, hair is not perfect. This technique makes flyaway hairs, the kinds on the outside, not on the inside, as you can see in this picture. But the kinds on the outside, it makes them just disappear. It's like 
pure magic, okay? But it gives you just this clean, kind of pure, very, very dreamy look. This is not going to work for every kind of portrait. Remember, if somebody says to you, hey, could you shoot a portrait for me? The first thing you should ask is why. Why do you want the portrait? What's going to be for? Think about it, right? A portrait that's going to hang in a frame on a wall in a fancy living room above a fireplace certainly would not look like one of these. In fact, a portrait that was going to be on a LinkedIn profile, this is not ideal. A portrait that's going to be used for a dating app, this is probably not ideal, right? So these are definitely kind of very creative type scenarios. Uh, also, you can you know use them for glamour type images and things like that, which I'll show you some examples. But Again, it's a very dreamy look that works really well. And it's ultimately one more tool in your lighting toolkit. That's why you should actually care about it. It's one more creative option that you have. So I don't want to make it sound like I use this for every picture because you know I don't. And I would certainly never encourage you to do that. But it's a great technique for you to learn, uh, kind of nail it down. And then it's always there when it can help you out. So again, all of these, one of the things that you'll notice first and foremost, there are no catch lights from this technique. Now you'll read in the article a statement that I made, and that is that as I've gotten a little bit older, as I spent a little bit more time with my wife, who is the cognitive psychologist, and I've learned a little bit more about the way our brains process information, I do a slightly modified version of this technique now so that I do get a very small catch light in the eye whenever possible, right? And that's key. And I'm going to show you the examples as I'm talking about them. The reason I do that is very simple. It's based upon what do our brains expect. I still love these older versions that I did. And it's simply because if I'm shooting close, like the, the last few images I've showed you, it's not a problem because I'm close enough that I see the detail and the color in the subject's eyes. If I'm shooting at a three-quarter length or even a full length, that's when it kind of really becomes a problem because then the eyes just tend to appear dark and it's very hard to get any kind of detail out of them. So having even a small catch light can be very, very helpful. In fact, if you look really close, and I know it's going to be very hard to see on YouTube, there's actually in this particular shot Two really tiny catch lights, one in each eye, but they're actually not from a strobe. They happen to be from a recessed ceiling light in the studio behind me. So one of my cheats with this technique in my home studio for quite a while was just do it with two lights, the reflectors in the front. Again, I'm going to show you that in a minute. But I would still manage to get a catch light because I would get a small, warm tone catch light from the light in the ceiling. So I give you that little piece of information just so that you don't necessarily chase your tail thinking, well, I've always got to have this light in front to get the catch light. No, a lot of times you can take advantage of existing lighting to get a catch light. It's just about having that little extra pop in the eyes is what you're after. And then, you know, examples like this one where obviously you can see there's zero catch light whatsoever, okay? A little bit more of a glamour scenario. Um, on YouTube, it may look almost as if there are vertical catch lights, but those are reflectors that are on the side of her in this case that I had moved forward a little bit more in addition to the ones that are in the front. So there's reflectors here, and then there's reflectors out here that the camera's shooting through, right? And so picked up a little bit of a, a hint of kind of a vertical type feel. So a lot of these examples you can see uh, in the article. The article breaks it all down. But let me go ahead. I'm going to switch over to my other display here. And I'm going to show you a couple of the scenarios for this. In fact, uh, let's, let's actually work backwards. We're going to start at three lights. I mentioned as I've gotten a little bit older, I find myself frequently adding that front light but we're talking at about a three to one, four to one, even five to one lighting ratio. So that front light, it is not there to light my subject. In fact, um, you'll notice in the little preview up in the upper right hand corner of the screen here, the software is actually not capable of rendering this lighting technique. That's how much out of the box this technique is. But I promise you, it works and it's golden, okay? So 
Um, one set that I will do, well, you notice I'm not actually using reflectors in front of my subject. I'm just using these V flats to block the light on the background. And then at about a three to one ratio, I'm using this light in a 33 inch uh, octobox in front to do a little bit of fill. You can create, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn these off. You can create the same thing with two lights and the one in the front, two lights in the back, one in the front, and then just flag the lights from not hitting her if you don't have reflectors that will do that. You'll notice my reflectors, if I turn those black ones off, I am picking up a little bit of light on the edge of her. You can see the spread, but not much, right? So I would still be inclined to do that. Now, I know some of you are gonna be thinking, oh great, now I gotta go out and buy V-flats or whatever. Look, V-flats are great, but they're expensive, right? They just are. You can accomplish what you're seeing on the screen now with V-flats. You can accomplish it with a small piece of foam board that you have like used, um, um, yeah, gaffer's tape, excuse me, gaffer's tape to tape it to the side of your seven inch reflector. You could use aluminum foil. It doesn't even have to be black aluminum foil. Basically, all you want to do is flag that background light so that it's not hitting your subject. Understand too that one of your options, you'll notice I set up here kind of the traditional scenario, which everybody tends to go for, and that is where you set your lights almost kind of out at 45 degrees, but there's nothing to prevent us from moving this light in, okay, and then crossing them a little bit. Bottom line, as long as they're not in the shot. Now, um, making that change that I just made, I need to adjust the power of the light a little bit and bring it down because I've just made the light brighter in the middle. But again, all of that is very doable. So the moral to the story here with this concept, this backlit concept, is that you don't have to be stuck with a group of rules on how to use it. You can do it with one light. You can do it with two lights. You can do it with three lights. You don't need more than three. You just don't. Um, speed lights will work fine. This is a lighting arrangement that actually benefits from small spaces. So if you have a low ceiling in the space you're working in, that makes it a lot easier because that low ceiling is going to contain a lot of the light and, and allow it to, to bounce around, which is also very, very helpful, right? So uh, it's the type of, of um, technique that you can experiment with and really come up with a lot of options for it. Don't get yourself trapped in following a one, two, three rule and do it the way this photographer does. Because I, I, I guarantee you, any photographer that's doing it has more than one way that they do it, right? It's the feel of the picture, to go back to the Burt Stern quote, much more so than the actual technique. That's what you know we're, we're concerned about and that's what we want in the shot, okay? So... Uh, I encourage you, check out the article. Again, the link is in the description below the video. Uh, experiment with it a little bit. I guarantee you, you will have a little bit of fun with it. Now, a couple last warnings, right? Number one, uh, make sure you didn't miss that part where I said you're looking at anywhere from like a three to one to a five to one lighting ratio to get this to work. The higher the, the, the difference, the more glow you're gonna get around a subject. Now, uh, no matter what you do, your image is gonna come out of the camera looking very flat, low in contrast. This is not a lot of Photoshop work. This is easy Photoshop work to do, right? All you're going to do when you go into Photoshop is you're gonna grab the black slider and bring the black slider down. Not the contrast slider, the black slider. And you'll be good to go. You're gonna see this perfect image just pop into view. Now, you notice I've been avoiding saying color black and white. I love this for black and white, but as you saw, I've used it for color. I do both with it, right? So in color, you're just going to be adjusting the contrast, excuse me, the contrast, yes, but you're doing it with the black slider. In black and white, there's two things that need to happen. First thing actually starts in the camera. If you want a black and white image, I would encourage you set your camera to monochrome or black and white, whichever your brand camera does. Every camera on the market today will allow you to shoot 
this this monochrome or black and white setting in RAW, okay? Set your camera to black and white so that you're seeing a black and white image. Another tip when you do that, each company calls it, uh, literally each company calls it a very different thing. In fact, here, let me get the list. Um, where is it here? So Nikon calls it picture control. Canon calls it picture styles. Uh, Sony refers to them as creative looks. Fuji does it with two things, film simulations and black and white simulations. Olympus calls it picture mode. Uh, and Panasonic calls it color effects. But that's where you change it over to black and white, right? So you're going to, in camera, switch your camera to those that setting, whatever your brand calls it. But within that setting, on every one of those brands... And I know I've left out Pentax, but I'm willing to bet Pentax does it too, okay? Uh, once you're into that setting, you are then also going to increase the contrast for that setting in camera to a plus two or plus three. Go as, as high of that that your camera will allow. There are some cameras now that go plus four or five. I promise you, you're not really going to like that. Uh, some cameras only go to a plus two, depending on the, the make and the model, that type of stuff. So plus two or plus three. When you see the image in your EVF or on your LCD, you're going to be looking at a finished black and white image. It's going to look amazing, right? Now, when you download the images and you open them up in your culling software, whether it's Lightroom, Bridge, or whatever you're using, you'll see them pop onto the screen in black and white and then magically flip back to color. All the black and white data is gone. And that's okay. So why would we do that in camera if we know the data is going to go away? Because we want to make sure that the image that we're photographing and the way that we're lighting it and the way that we're exposing it is going to look great in black and white. That's why we're doing it. And then in your processing software, you're going to do the black and white conversion. You'll switch the image over to black and white. And then just like with the color, you're going to pull the blacks down and your contrast is going to come right into play. Okay. So uh, don't forget that. I told you about that. It's in the article. It breaks it down. It's actually super simple. You do it once or twice, you'll be a pro at it. it it's not a difficult technique to master at all. Okay? All right. Uh, let's move on. Did you hit the thumbs up yet? I hope you did. Uh, again, it helps people find out about the show, gets the word out, would be greatly appreciated. Oh, and you know what? I want to take a moment, and I, I want to... Uh, apologize. And, oh, two things. One, the thumbs up. Just in case you think I'm wasting your time, I don't know why you're still here. But if you are, feel free to hit the thumbs down. It's okay. It helps me out either way. I'm just asking for your help to get the word out. Feel free to tell people how much it sucks. Go right ahead. That's okay, right? Um, the other thing, it has been brought to my attention recently. Few people have tried to find polite ways to say something um, that of late, especially there have been a tremendous amount of ads running during the last frame. So ultimately, that's my fault, and I'm sorry, but I am, I swear to you, I was not aware that it was that bad. YouTube is in the process of changing the way they handle all of the ads. In fact, by next year, unless you pay for YouTube Premium as a user, you, it, it's going to be horrible on every video you watch, unfortunately, because they're taking the control away from the creators. Um, I mean, there's two choices. As a creator, you can set the control, in which case they've made it really clear you're not going to make much money at all, or you can let them set it, but then they're going to decide. The upside is what they're promising in return. So here's, here's the payoff. We'll keep our fingers crossed. They're promising that you as the user will get better ads that are better targeted, um, as well as references for videos that you are more likely interested in. But um, I dug into the whole setting stuff a little bit today, uh, did figure out where I'm able to make some of the changes. So hopefully by the time we get back here next week, this one was already, I had it set up and it was out there, so I couldn't change it. Hopefully by the time we get back next week, uh, we'll cut some of those ads down. And yes, I appreciate all of you tolerating the ads because I do need to make a couple bucks with this. Uh, but believe me, it's not much. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I hate having to watch tons of ads, right? So um, I'm going to be working to streamline that, I, I promise you, okay?
All right. You know, I'm going to be honest with you right out of the box. I am probably going to wind up in a bit, of a bit of a rant over this topic tonight. It drives me nuts. It just drives me absolutely nuts. And I'm going to do my darndest to stay cool about it, but also keep it real. And instead of just complaining about the problem, because I'm a big believer, like any idiot can point out a problem, right? I'm a big believer in it. So the challenge is, you know, what are you putting forth to help solve the problem? So that is a big part of my goal. And I hope to do this in two ways. One, to create a little bit of better understanding of the problem in and of itself. Uh, and two, to even offer up some um, solutions, okay? But I started kind of writing an article, which I am going to finish the article and then realize like, no, nah, there's just too much I want to say and this article is going to take me a while. So I've got some notes. I'm going to go through some things, but here's the gist, right? Obviously, I'm sure it doesn't surprise you that I spend an inordinate amount of time on social media. Uh, fortunately, not doom scrolling, but just in posting and communicating with people and planning my, you know, my workout, I, I'm on social media a lot. Um, I have developed many techniques over the years to prevent me from just you know, having shiny object syndrome and, and going down the rabbit hole of, oh, this is interesting, right? But lately, and when I say lately, this has been really brewing for about a year, but it's getting worse. I mean, it's little, literally getting worse. Every time I log in to one of my feeds on Facebook or Twitter or threads and even Instagram, it's always memes on Instagram, but any one of those, I am seeing post after post after post after post of photographers whining and bitching and complaining and photographers standing on a soapbox telling people, this is why I cost you money and why you should pay it. And by the way, what they're telling people is bullshit. I'll explain that. There is something they should be telling them. What they should be telling them, you know, when a photographer's making posts out there that says, this is why I cost what I cost. What they should be saying is, I'm sorry I cost what I cost because I'm too damn lazy to improve my skills, run a more efficient business and provide a better client experience so that you will be falling over yourself to hire me. That's what they should be saying. But instead, they blame the people out in the interwebs. Right? So, that being said, and by the way, I want to be really clear. Um, amateurs are at fault for this. Semi-professionals are at fault for this. Professionals are at fault for this. Influencers are at fault for this. I mean... You know, look, I'm not naming any names tonight because some of them I consider to be friends, but like just keeping it real, right? You know, some of these people that have been doing this influencer stuff for quite a while lately, you know, there's one, there's one headshot photographer, well-known headshot photographer in Canada who has a Facebook group. So his posts are, they stay in the group. I'll give him that. But he has a Facebook group where he posts memes about clients nonstop. He's a person that's supposed to be teaching people and helping people. There are other YouTube influencers that, you know, every other day you're seeing pictures of them in the gym. You're seeing how ripped their abs are. You know, you're hearing about how their life is upside down. Woe is me. Woe is that. What, what the hell does that have to do? Everybody that follows them on social media follows them because of the education and the entertainment that they provided. And now suddenly everybody's got to be brought down because things aren't going well for them. Because yeah, it sucks to be a YouTuber right now. All those people that went full time in YouTube jumped the gun way too early because they didn't really look at the history of how these kinds of things evolve. And they're finding now that they can't make the same kind of money that they used to. 
And so they're whining and they're complaining. You know, we all have to understand, and, and by the way, I know there's probably at least a few of you that are, you know, like, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. Honestly, you're lucky, but I'll show you some examples. In fact, you know what? Let me, let me show you a few. So I don't want to, I, I told you, I do not want to call anybody out. I've already alluded to some people already. That is not my goal because honestly, there's problems everywhere. In fact, there are even companies and associations in our industry, who should be setting a better example, that are buying into it. You know why they're buying into it? They're buying into it because it's a trend. They're buying into it because photographers click on it. Photographers comment on it. Photographers debate on it. What does social media reward you for? Engagement. But this doesn't help your business. So here, I'll give you a couple examples. This is just a few, right? This is a post I found, this was a couple weeks ago. Uh, and again, all names have been covered to protect the guilty, right? Um, you know, this person posts this asking for thoughts, sound off below. Professional photographers spend an average of one plus hours prepping emails, consults, et cetera, one to three hours shooting, 10 to 30 minutes editing per picture, four to 12 hours total, five plus hours of everything else, driving, posting, ordering, packaging, delivering, et cetera. Per session, they invest thousands of dollars of in equipment, software and props to spend countless hours learning how to produce beautiful images. They don't get paid for vacation or sick days. They don't get bonuses for outstanding performances for their holidays, and they don't have insurance plans uh, of any benefits, and 35% of their profit goes straight to tax. Please understand that they are business owners and they have a love for photography, but that love won't pay their bills. I'm really shocked that whoever made this didn't bitch about the fact that photographers don't get tipped. I mean, why not? Why isn't that part of the list? Like, it fails right there, okay? But then this person shares this and says, I have insurance because of my photography. Photographers deserve to be able to pay their bills or at least some of them through their craft and their work. I really wish I had a sound effect for a record scratch when I said photographers deserve to be able to pay their bills. So let's just clarify a couple things so that we're all on the same page. If you look up the word photographer in the dictionary, anybody that owns a camera is a photographer. Photographers. That's the definition. Depending on which dictionary you look at, they will allude to the fact that photography can be a profession, but anybody's a photographer. Photographers don't deserve to be able to pay their bills. Plumbers don't be able, or don't deserve to be able to pay their bills. Electricians don't deserve to be able to pay their bills. Just because you were dumb enough to spend thousands of dollars on gear and decide I'm in business, probably after you paid for a logo and a business card, that doesn't mean that you deserve jack, you know what? You don't deserve anything. Yes, I'm old school. This is one of those cases where I'm Gen X and I'm proud of it. But look, here's the cool part. History says I'm right. And I know I'm right. It's the rest of you. It's those people that are posting this crap. They're the ones that I'm just waiting for them to catch up because they're wrong. And they're learning it the hard way. Now, before I show you some of the others, big picture thinking again for a minute, right? A lot of this, but not all of it. That's the problem. A lot of it is because technology, and this is not a complaint, this is just, you know, this is observing, just taking a breath and observing, right? A lot of it is because we have this really, really interesting scenario in photography now in 2023 compared to what we had in 1971 when I bought my very first camera. Photography is much more accessible. Basic photography, Basic. In other words, the ability to make a, a pretty nice picture is much easier because of the technology we have. And I'm not complaining. I'm actually kind of glad I had to work a little harder to learn it. But the fact is, I'm also thrilled that more people have access to photography and can learn it easier than ever before. I think that's great. Okay. But as a result of that, think of the logic. As a result of that, more people wind up taking half decent pictures quicker 
we live in a time period, which is, this part's not necessarily bad, but it's a change. We live in a time period where, you know, everybody gets a participation trophy and we're supposed to be very nice to people. It's kind of hard to see that when we start looking at politics and things like that. But for the most part, I think that's a good thing in the fact that we try as a society, for the most part, to encourage people and to be nice to them, right? Because we need that. Let's be real, right? We need that. But because of that, it's very easy for people to get a false sense of confidence, a false sense of ability, because the gap is not as big as it used to be. But while the gap's not as big, it's every bit as deep. Every bit as deep. In large part, because once you decide to try and be a professional photographer, all the rules change, whether you like it or not. And you don't deserve anything. You have to earn it. Just because you spent all this money, just because you made a logo and maybe a website and got a business card. I know, business cards are like so 1995, right? But a logo and a website doesn't mean that you deserve to make money or deserve to pay your bills. And the irony of it is, the photographers that are out there doing the grind every day, you don't hear them on social media. You don't hear them pissing and moaning. You don't ever see them sharing memes like this or liking the memes or any of that kind of stuff. You don't see any of that crap because they're out there doing the job. Living the dream, that's what they're doing. They're being photographers. I'm making a big issue of this because I feel it really, really unfortunate. All these people that are doing this, when I say all, I truly believe, like all of these people, I believe that they're passionate about photography. I believe that they are passionate about wanting to succeed and to grow and to potentially have a career as a photographer. Somebody needs to give them that kind of virtual shove in the chest to say, hey, step back. Let's take a good look at your work. Let's take a good look at how you're marketing yourself. How are you presenting yourself to the world? Let's take a good look at who your clients are or who you want your clients to be and what do those people want? Because it unfortunately doesn't matter what you want. It matters what your clients want. Right? It just does. So here, I'll share uh, share another one with you here. This was, uh, I'm going to call them out because you know what? It's funny on one hand, but it's also not funny if you're a Sony user. Now I get it. Some Sony users will laugh about it and, and say, yep, that's me, right? Other Sony users will be like, hey, but here we have a company that's, you know, at the top of the heap in our industry and yeah, I see the humor in it. Yes, I think it's funny. But when you look at this in the big context, it's the wrong approach. I mean, unfortunately, uh, here's another one. Now, I will tell you, and again, all names are removed to protect the guilty. But I will tell you this. This is from Threads, the new Instagram platform. Uh, I believe this person also posts on Twitter. I'm not sure. Uh, but I will tell you, this person is a Nikon ambassador. This is a brand ambassador for a camera company. Okay? Anyone take anyone can take a photo, but not everyone can be a photographer. I'm, I'm, I'm all in on that one. But then, here we go. This person comes back and says, also, the reason I say this today is because of how many folks are relying on camera gear to take photos for them. I agree with that too, but I don't know that I would frame it quite like that. And then this person comes back and says, do you think there's a difference? This was another person now. Do you think there's a difference between one taking a photo versus making a photo? And then this Nikon ambassador comes back. Yes. And I say, take a photo because it's in the terms of what the mass public uses. Put down. Also, I don't take or make photos. I create art. Whew. This is a photographer whose self-esteem I want because clearly they have great self-esteem. Just saying, okay? Uh, another one here. Had a convo with a couple of friends today and found that many of us in the photography community are suffering from the, the following. And my God, like, please, 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 I want you to, to think about those commercials 
um, I can't remember the name of the 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 woman the, the woman that sings the, the really sad ballad and they have the pictures of all the dogs that need to be adopted and and they want you to donate money to save all these you know dogs that are stuck outside and abused and all that please let that commercial roll in your head I'm gonna read okay here we go had a combo with a couple of friends today and found that many of us in the photography community are suffering from the following no pay underpayment imposter syndrome burnout, collapsing under capitalism. Oh my God. Just want to make our art, but can't muster the creativity because we're struggling financially or going through some shit. Who's not going through some shit? Just saying. Uh, Come on, right? Goes on to say, hang in there, people. Trying to take my own advice, but remember, there's a reason why you love this. Make sure you find it again if you forgot why. That piece, I love to hear. So at least we finished on a high note. We did. We finished that one on a high note. But look, come on. And I know I'm sounding like a jerk right now. That's how a lot of people are going to frame it. That's fine. Suffering from no pay, underpayment, imposter syndrome, burnout, collapsing under capitalism, all that. No, you're not suffering. You're not entitled to pay your bills as a photographer unless you bust your ass do what you do to the best of your ability. And then as you've all heard me say many, many times over, find the people dumb enough to pay you to do it. It is that simple. If these people that are doing the bitching would have paid attention in history class, history, they would have known that. If they put in a little effort now, even to learn about business, they would know that this is such a horrible idea. So I think I have another one. Is there another one? Let's let's see here. Oh yeah. So this look, you all know I love PPA. Love PPA. And look, this is funny. We've all heard this joke before. This joke is like you know circa 1950, right? I, you know, uh, what not to say to a professional photographer? Your camera takes nice pictures. But here we have the leading organization in our industry jumping in on a social media trend. Which by default, what does that do? It encourages photographers to post these memes and share these memes. Because this is the same organization that provides social media-ready marketing material to its clients, to its members, us. Okay? I think I have another one. Yeah, this one went around for a while. So this particular guy, just in case you ever wondered. So he's talking to his clients. This guy's talking to his clients, right? Just in case you ever wonder why I watermark your proofs. Not saying my clients would do this, but... When I work to bring you great photos, I hope the respect is there not to steal my work or any other photographer. So why don't I point out, and this was what he shared with some article that made the rounds about some some retoucher or digital artist bragging about the fact that they they didn't care about watermarks and they could remove any watermark. And it had traction. This was about a month or two ago. But, you know, this guy is saying, look, you know, I hope the respect is there. I hope the respect is there. You earn respect. You treat your customers right. You provide them a good experience. You give value and then you get respect. To share stuff like this, is this why people came to you and paid you to take pictures? No. Are you expecting your clients to take their time and follow a link on a social media post to go and read All of this drama, because believe me, that article is drama. Big drama. Why? If your plumber asked you to do that, would you do it? If your electrician asked you to do that, would you do it? No. If your doctor asked you to do that, would you do it? No, you'd run the other way. And by the way, those people all have to be licensed. Pretty much everywhere. Photographers, on the other hand, don't require a license. Consider yourself lucky. Because if it required a license, there wouldn't be near as many photographers. Right? There, there just wouldn't. Just like drones were taken off in massive popularity, especially here in the United States, until suddenly you had to get an FAA license to fly a drone. And now, drones are still popular but not nearly like they were. Drone sales have gone down dramatically 
from where they were a few years ago. It leveled off and started to dip because it requires a license to fly them, right? So let's see, do I have another one? No, that was it. Okay, so so again, I don't, I don't want to go through and, and read this whole thing. I, I am going to post an article, um, you know, next week. But look, I see a lot of these memes also. I want to be fair and I want to be balanced that are freaking hysterical. They just are, okay? People, we got to use some common sense. No business model ever has benefited from complaining to or about your customers publicly. No business model ever has benefited from making fun of their customers. Adorama apparently thinks differently. So, yeah, is there humor to it? To a degree, but does that make it right? Does that make it good? And in the overall climate of the way people are behaving, no. It doesn't at all. They need to do better. We all need to do better. And we should not be participating in it. Maybe I am old school and maybe, you know, I am over the hill and irrelevant. But to me, those are the conversations. Those are the sentiments. Those are the thoughts. Those are the jokes that happen person to person. Privately. Not publicly. And that's the thing that a lot of people struggle with. And I will tell you this, one last thing before I leave this alone. Um, I do find that statistically, and, and this, is not, this is not published research. This is just my own observations because I, I really do look. By the way, uh, one of those quotes that I shared with you was actually posted by the co-organizer of one of the biggest photography events in the United States. Okay. Um, I do find that photographers age 30 to 40, that age group seems to be the biggest offenders of this. Um, I fortunately, thank God, I don't see a lot of Gen Zers posting these kinds of things and, and complaining. The, the Gen Zers don't have the tolerance for all the crazy minutia on, on social media. They're the smart ones, believe me. Uh, and that's gonna, it's gonna cause a huge shift on social media and how it's used for marketing and everything else, which is, is good. I mean, again, social media is still growing up. It's still evolving. But um, yeah, it, 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 for the most part, it's 30 to 40 year olds. And then everybody above 40, they just like to have a, a disagreeing opinion, period. Uh, the overwhelming majority of comments that I get on my photo quotes online that are like, that's bull crap or that's wrong, whatever. I guarantee that person's got gray hair 99% of the time. That person's got gray hair. Sorry if you're old, but like social media, it, it, there's nothing anywhere in the terms and conditions or social rules of social media that says you have to disagree with things and let the world know, right? Uh, especially when, you know, most of the people that are leaving those comments couldn't shoot the side of a barn if they're standing in front of it and they're, you know, arguing with an iconic photographer. It's like, come on. Take a couple minutes and read, and you might actually learn something. So, think about it, gang. Do better. We need to do better as an industry, right? And, you know, we need to help these people move forward, period. So, questions. There were a couple that went through. I want to get them. I got a little bit of time left. Um, let's see. From <laughs> Cooley, maybe they need a little wine with that cheese. Yeah, I think it's going to take a little more than that, Cooley. But, Hey, you never know, right? Uh, Blair's telling me, uh, yeah, it happens in Canada. Uh, he sees it mainly with uh, wedding photographers. Uh, yep. Mark, personal responsibility is rare these days. Well, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we we don't actually have good leadership for that in general. And so it's permeating everywhere, right? Um <laughs> <laughs> Somebody loves my rants. Okay. Cafel Music, how much did you pull the blacks down? Great question. No answer. Uh, it's going to depend on the image. It's going to depend on your ratio. Uh, so the honest answer, Cafel Music, is 
until it looks good, right? So I know you want more context than that, but I promise you, that's the answer. So let me actually give you one other little piece that will help you, right? Um, I have always, because this is the way that I was taught, and this is what I like to see. So this isn't a rule, but I have always um, gone along with the Ansel Adams school of black and white imagery, meaning a good black and white image is going to have pure black, pure white, and all of the grays in between, right? Uh, he was a big outspoken proponent of that. Um, so I still can't tell you how much Cafel music because it's going to depend on the given image and the ratio, but I can tell you my goal is to get that range in the image. I want to have some pure blacks, I want to have pure white, and I want to have all the gray tones in between, even though it is a heavily backlit image. And by the way, for those of you that live by histograms, <laughs> Don't even look at your histogram when you do this kind of a shot because the histogram is going to be shoved all the way over, right? So, um, yeah, you're not going to get a bell-shaped histogram out of out of this technique. So it's, it's all visual. Uh, so it's one of the things Kefel uh, experiment with a little bit, but you'll have a lot of fun with it. Uh, Mark Johnson uses a Manfrotto highlighter or highlight for this. Yep, uh, you can totally do that. Uh, I just saw another one coming here. Um, Chabuzo, did you ever have a bad experience with a client that made you reconsider your decision to take up photography? <laughs> How did you handle it? I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh because you you told me when you came in, Chabuzo, that you actually made a post online recently. So you were afraid that tonight was, you know, about you. It's not about you. Um, yeah, you know, Chabuzo, here's what I would tell you sincerely. Um, if you recently had an experience with a client that's making you reconsider your decision to take up photography, um, I would say one, so let me give you, let me give you the tough love first, and then I'm going to give you even a little bit more. Okay. Number one, welcome to the club, right? Um, I don't think you're going to be able to find a professional photographer anywhere in the world, Chibuzo, that has never had at least one client. Uh, God, I wish I only had one and many that may be reconsidered, but here's what they may be reconsider. So I, I know what you meant, but I'm going to address what you typed. You asked if I ever had a client that made you reconsider your decision to take up photography. Hell no. I will be the first to admit, and anybody that says otherwise is lying. Photography is an incredibly selfish pursuit. I do it for me. That's why you guys hear me. I said it even earlier. The idea about do what you do to the best of your ability and then find people that don't have to pay for it. That's what photography is. I do what I want. I have this responsibility in life to make money, to pay bills, to support my family. So I accept the challenge. I do what I want to do as a photographer, what excites me. And then I find the people that will pay me for that, the people that see the value in the work that I do. But understand, I'm not just over here selfishly doing my thing and hoping somebody sees value. I understand it's my responsibility to provide value as well. In other words, the experience that I'm giving that client. So, you know, in those situations, Shibuzo, here's, you know, kind of the real aspect of it. Number one, never let somebody take photography away from you in terms of it being your passion or your enjoyment in life. Nobody gets to decide what you are passionate about. Nobody gets to decide what you enjoy, period, right? End of sentence. Um, everybody's a little bit different. You know, for me, when I have days like that, uh, I'll rant about it for a while, not on social media. I will rant about it to my wife or, you know, even sometimes my son. My son and I talk, keep in mind, my son's 40 years old, right? But my son and I will talk business a lot. Uh, so, I, you know, I might rant to him. And, and my family, the people that know me that are close to me, they know that's like my vent. I just need to, I need to air that out. And, and my wife, she's amazing at because every now and then, oftentimes she just listens and that's it. And I move on. And every now and then she'll point something out in the middle and it's kind of like, oh, yeah. that's why she has a PhD and I don't, right? Um, but so it can be helpful to have somebody listen to your vent. But remember, just because you're upset, your vent's going to happen really in two ways. The first part of your vent is all that hot air, right? Come on, we're human. The first part of the vent is that hot air. It's that steam. You just, you just got to get it out because you want to explode. But that's when you do. You need to have somebody that you can keep talking it through with. And, and not, that person may not be able to solve your problem. 
look, I've solved many of my business problems in life just by listening to myself. Not trusting myself. That's a different piece of the conversation. Listening to myself. Talking to somebody about what was going on and just hearing it come back to me out of my own mouth. It's like, you know what? I should try this. Or I should have done that. Or I could have done this. Whatever. And then it, at the end of all that, one of the hardest things about becoming a professional photographer, Chibuzo, that is knowing when a client should not be your client. It is okay to divorce a client. It is okay to not take on a client. The sooner you learn that, the sooner you come to terms with that, the fewer the times that you will run in to this kind of a situation. So I hope that helps. Uh, I know I'll probably get some kickback for tonight, but seriously, all of you, thank you for listening. Um, you know the drill. You got less time ahead of you than you do behind you. So get out there, pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios, gang.